So my wife and I um, started attending Emergence in 2019 with our twin daughters who were 16 at the time. And um, as soon as we arrived, we knew that this was our church home because we immediately felt at home um, because of the really strong teaching from the Bible, going through verse by verse. And by the grace of God, in October of 2020, our daughters gave their lives to Christ um, and they were going to college the following summer. So in June, they, um, they both decided they wanted to get baptized as a public proclamation of their faith. And they were able to do that at Ringwood in a very small service with Steve, with just a few families who were also getting baptized. That was a really wonderful answer to prayer for my wife and I, because we really wanted them to have a know that they were saved before going to college and have a firm foundation um, in Christ and in discipleship, which Emergence gave them. So putting Jesus first is a realization and acknowledgement that everything that we have is a gift from God, whether it's our talents, our homes, our families, and um, our life circumstances, including our careers. So. Uh, everything that we have, including financially, is from God and we are just stewards of what he has given us. So as stewards, that compels me to live more generously and to give so that the kingdom of God and his gospel can go out to more people. And after our initial qualms, which I think some people might have about tithing, we eventually, by the grace of God, overcame them and became quite faithful in our giving to the extent that it became quite manageable. So my prayer is to be led by the Spirit to be even more sacrificial in giving so that um, we are more intentional in what we do give to further expand what God is doing. So I believe that God will open yet more doors and allow emergence to grow in ways that even now people can't imagine so that it becomes a place that is welcoming is large enough for all the people that are going to be reached in North Jersey for the gospel and that they can find a loving and accommodating home as a body of believers here. Pastor Ryan always says this is one of the least reached areas for the gospel North Jersey so I think that Emergence has a unique opportunity used by God to, to be this center point, to be the home where Christians can gather and reach other people. And I believe we have assurance um, when we do pray because we have promises of God. Good morning. Uh, good to be with you. Grateful for Chuba and his story, uh, just his faithfulness, and uh, just awesome to see God's work in him and his family, and uh, just the courage to share it. And so if, uh, if, if you got your books, we're going to be on page 41 today up in Ringwood. It's still page 41, and so uh, excited, to, um, excited to be kind of teaching through uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 with you guys and, and diving into it. Before we do, I just want to say tonight we have our advanced commitment night. It's actually cool. Our Ringwood campus is going to come down. And at 6 p.m., uh, our hope is, and we prayed a lot for this night, prayed for you specifically, and our hope is on this night that um, we see in the scriptures and in moments like this, leaders go first. And so uh, the hope is that we're going to come with our uh, commitment cards and just make a, make a decision to say, okay, we're, we're in faith, going to respond and see what God has for us. And uh, even some of you guys, you're like, man, I, I don't even know yet what I want to do. Uh, I, w I would still encourage you to come tonight. We're going to worship. We're going to do a, t a teaching in First Chronicles. I know many of you were just there this morning, and so this will be a continuation of that time. Uh, we'll be in First Chronicles looking at an amazing section of Scripture and uh, excited to gather tonight at 6. And uh, we have been praying that this will be a powerful moment for you, uh, for your family, one of those times that's life kind of legacy shaping where you look back at in that moment, 
I know clearly I took a step of faith for God. And so our, our hope is that we would uh, we'd begin that process tonight as a church. And so I look forward to worshiping with you. Uh, do all you can. If you got some plans, I would I would just encourage you to try to make that a priority and, uh, and excited about what we're going to do tonight. And so, all right, here we go. Second Corinthians, if you're visiting, glad you're here. We're in an initiative called First, where we're hoping by the grace of God to really push in over these next two years. Uh, God has answered a huge prayer for us as a church and allowed allowing us to acquire uh, additional space that we needed, that a lot of people said was impossible, but with God, uh, the impossible is possible. And so he answered that prayer, we have the space, and we're in a season where we're hoping two things happen. One, the primary goal over the next few years is our hope is that every person is taking a step where they're putting Jesus first in their lives, where they're saying more than anything else, I know Jesus first, he's greater than everything else. It shapes my whole life, it changes how I live live. And our hope is if if that happens, we are really ecstatic to see what God can do. And then we're entering a season of some advanced generosity in the hopes to begin to renovate some of the uh, space we acquired for children, for students, for the next generation to hear the gospel for first-time visitor classes and the beginning of the expansion of the lobby, ultimately to construct uh, a a thousand-plus seat auditorium uh, so we can continue to reach people with the good news of the gospel. And God keeps answering prayers and opening doors. And so we're just going to keep walking through them in faith and excited about the conversations that this is bringing up in terms of what God's entrusted to us and what it looks like for us to be faithful. And to do that, we're looking at 2 Corinthians where Paul... We've said it a lot that this is something we see throughout the scriptures. Paul's doing something very similar. He's raising resources to minister to the needs of the Christians in Jerusalem. He's doing that in a number of different churches. We see it a couple times in the Old Testament. Here he's working with a church in Corinth, and it's probably the most expanded section in the scriptures on generosity, where last week we got to see kind of the heart of why we should be generous, why it's central to understanding the gospel, that for Jesus became poor for us so that we could become rich. Uh, that that's ultimately the model for us to be generous is Jesus himself. God gave his first, God gave his best in his son, and Jesus willingly went and gave himself for us, and our hope is to respond. And Paul laid out that framework last week. Uh, Today he's going to begin to urge them now to action, and look what he writes. And in this matter, I give my judgment, this benefits you, who a year ago started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. So now finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. Paul goes, all right, we did this like a year ago. We got together. We talked about the need. Everyone said they're in. Like they did their advanced commitment night, right? And they came together. Uh, They rallied. He said the desire's there. Now let's see that that desire is matched with doing. Right? Paul knows there's a difference between those who just desire things and those who actually do things. Right? So the truth is, Satan's okay with your desires. He's okay with your goals. He's okay with your good intention. He's okay with your big dreams. The difference between those who simply desire to do things for the glory of God and those who actually do things is, are you ready for this? This is an amazing point. I prayed about it wrote it down. Remember, you don't go to Redeemer Presbyterian Church. I know Tim Keller passed away, but like, don't expect big points like that. You ready for my big point I came up with this week? You can share it online if you're really willing, but um, this is going to be amazing. Get ready. I see the pens are ready in the guidebook. Um, The difference between those who desire things and those who actually do things Those who actually do things, do things. (laughs) Right? I know. It's amazing. Yep. Yep. And that's the big idea today. So, you know, you can really enjoy it all morning. Uh, the difference between those who simply desire it and those who do it, those who do it eventually just do it. They, they go into the thing they fear. They walk through the obstacle. They go into the place that God's calling them. And Paul goes, listen, uh, it's time now to move. I love that you desire to do this. I love that you want to honor the Lord. Now it's time to simply honor the Lord. And we're going to see four things today about 
about those who do things, those who do things for the glory of God. And, and I love just the wisdom of this passage in a lot of places. And so let, let's look at it together. He says this, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need. And there may be fairness. As it's written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack. He's like, okay, here's what I want you to do. When we're talking about generosity, I want you, and this is where this is, you and God, right? He goes, I want you to give according to what you have. Right? That's the goal. Between you and God, according to what you have. And this is where Paul realizes something, that people who actually do things are realistic. Right? Because he knows the two kind of pitfalls so often with people is some people, the second something like this comes up, they go right into fear mode. Right? Like, well, what about this? And what about the interest rates? And what about the economy? And what about the, the, the brewing war all over the world? What about all those things? And what happens is they go into fear mode and they start looking everywhere else. What about this? What about this? What about this? And here's the lie they fall for. Are you ready? This is one of the great lies of fear that somehow I'm in charge of my own security. As if I hold the world together and keep me safe. And my financial plan is going to be the thing that guides me to safety. Fear is, the, in some ways, is the ultimate arrogance that I protect myself. And I'm in charge of making sure everything works out. That's why the proverb says, the righteous in the day of trouble run to the Lord. The rich man runs to his wealth. Because what's the irony of that? As wealthy as you are, your ultimate fears, money can't stop. Money can't stop sickness. Money can't stop betrayal. Money can't stop a broken marriage. Money can't stop rebellious kids. Are, in, in some ways, it might make some of it harder. And one of the, the, the lies of money is that it's security. There are some advantages to being wise and saving and honoring the Lord in that way. But ultimate security can never be found in your resources. Ultimate security is in the Lord. And one of the mistakes that stops people from being generous is they fall for the lie of security and fear. Uh, others, though, go the other way, and they, they, they fall into what I just say. It's foolishness, right? They're not realistic because they're foolish. They set the bar, like, way up here. And they're like, you know, it, if I could just win the lottery then I'd be so generous. Well, God hasn't had you win the lottery, but God has you with a job. And he says, can you be generous with that job? I read a, a Norman Rockweller biography, and he's not really a guy you always want to quote in a sermon. Um, <laughs> he was a competitor. Uh, but he said something fascinating. I just, I just read it. Uh, he said, you know why I tithed when I made a million dollars? He said, because I tithed when my first paycheck was $1.50. And he said, I started that rhythm there. Now, the rest of his life, not worth emulating. <laughs> but, well, in some ways, he was very excellent in what he did. Uh, whatever, we're not talking about him. Um, <laughs> the point is, be realistic about what God's entrusted to you. And some people, what they do is they set this crazy bar, like way up here, and it's only generosity if I'm doing this. It's kind of like imagine you're in a, in a real state of decline, and you, you're just kind of out of shape, and you're sitting on the couch watching Netflix, and you're, you got the gallon of ice cream thing going, and you're doing like the doom swirl and just eating, eating. And as you're kind of falling apart, eating the ice cream, on Netflix comes a documentary on marathon runners. And you're like, this is fascinating. And um, you know, you're watching it. And you decide somewhere through the documentary and through the gallon, tomorrow I'm going to be a marathon runner. And you wake up the next day, you hit the alarm, and you decide I'm running 26 plus miles. What's going to happen to you? You will die. You will. You will drop. The first guy who ran it died. Like, because he's like that. Eh, and that's why they named it after him. Uh, you will die. 
And you'll at best get very injured because it takes a long time to get to the place where you run the marathon. And this is what the foolish thing is. The foolish thing is I got this crazy bar way up here and instead of going, where am I realistically? We put it way up here and then we get discouraged and injured and quit when we're not way up here. But Paul goes, no, no, no. Be realistic about where God has you. You don't always need to hit the home run. You don't always need to do the amazing thing. You just need to do the faithful thing. That is the wisdom of the biblical tithe. Right? The tithe says, what has God entrusted to you? What's faithful for you? Realistic. And I know some Christians debate about the concept of tithe. That's something we see in the Old Testament law. We actually don't see it solely in the Old Testament law. We see it before the law with Abraham. We don't see any specific teaching on it in the New Testament, though Jesus does say it's good. He says it's good that you tithe. Uh, just don't neglect the weightier matters of the law in that. Right? That's really the only teaching. But what I love about it, and it's always funny when Christians are like, well, you know, that's an Old Testament thing. As, as, that's a law thing. As if like in the law we see what? The heart of God. The things that God cares about. In fact, if anything, if you want to make any argument, you could make the argument that in the New Testament, we go further, right? Like Jesus says, you know, it's written, do not commit adultery. But I say, don't look at a woman lustfully. Like he takes it further. Like it's, it's always weird when people are like, yeah, we don't, we don't, you know, New Testament tied thing. We don't have to worry about that because Jesus died for our sins. So now you just give God like half a percent. <laughs> it's like doesn't make any sense when you work out that. But anyway, here's what I'd say, not legalistically or the wisdom of God with the tithe is it's something that takes some faith, but it's not crushing or crippling. Uh, something where he says, trust me, uh, let me be priority. And what I love about it is I think it's a really great baseline to go, am I honoring the Lord in this area of generosity? Because uh, here's God's deal for us. It's a really good deal, by the way. He goes, hey, everything I have, everything you have is from the Lord. Well, I'm going to give you everything. Remember last week we saw in Colossians, uh, all things are by him and for him. He goes, I give it all to you. I entrusted you as a steward. Some of you guys are like, no, no, I earned it, man. I worked hard. All my other friends were out getting drunk and hung over. I was waking up early and, 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 and earning and saving and wise. And I didn't, you know, uh, waste my time or waste my money. Praise God, Right? But who gave you that discipline? Who gave you that work ethic? Who gave you the breath in your lungs? Who gave you the ability to do that? God did. And this is the only area of scripture. God actually goes, hey, when it comes to this area, test me. You believe that? God throws down the gold and he's like, then this test me, he says in Malachi. Because he's rebuking the people. He's going, you're robbing me. And you're like, how do you rob God? He goes, you're robbing me by not honoring me with tithes. He goes, that's, that's how you're doing it. Because it's robbery. And he goes, actually, like, it's amazing. He goes, test me on this and see my faithfulness. So God's going, okay, I entrust you everything you have. And here's our response. We then respond as stewards to go, I trust you first. God, you are the priority which is a fascinating word. And Pastor Steve sent this over to me this past week because I mentioned priority like a hundred times because we're talking about first. But Steve's like a language guy. You know, he's, he's always saying, you know, you said that wrong in the sermon. And you said that. I'm like, of course, it's, it's what I do. It's my thing to, to mispronounce things. Like, I don't get why anyone's even mad I mispronounce things. It's like they've been coming here for years. I say nothing right. I definitely can't say the word miracle. I've been practicing. I think I finally got it now. But it takes a long time, Okay. And uh, he said the word priority is really fascinating. This guy, is, I guess he's on some weird nerd thing, but uh, he, uh, he sent this nerd thing over to me. He said, and uh, the word priority in the fourth, <laughs> is he here? <laughs> Steve's really smart. He said the word priority in the 1400s, it was like you could only have one, okay? Uh, you, could, you could only have one priority. Only in, in the 1900s did we start using language like a list of priorities, and, but, but really, to have a priority means one. And it's one priority that shapes your life. So your family falls, as a Christian, under the priority of God. And, and honestly, that's the best thing you can do for your family. 
the best thing you could do for your children is to honor God. The, you know, the, the best thing you can do for your spouse is to honor God. Your house falls under the priority of worship to God. And what we do when we tithe or when we give our offerings to the Lord is we declare again, you are the priority that shapes all other priorities. And that's the area God says, come on, I want you to test me in this. I've given you everything. And I will give you everything. I give you your breath. I give you your life. I give you all things are by him and for him. And he goes, will my kids trust me? Or like, you know, imagine you had young kids and they open the fridge and they're like, I hope something's in there. You're like, guys, I got you. There's gonna, at least going to be condiments in there, right? There's going to, you can figure something out, you know? And God's looking at his people going, this is the, the beauty of this tithe. I entrust all things to you, and then you respond. Now, here's what's wild. How quickly, as one pastor says, do we turn into Schmeagel? We're just like, it's mine. It's the precious, you know? I earned it. And we just, isn't it interesting that of all the things, there's only, of all the things Jesus talks about, and he talks about money almost more than any other thing, when it comes to money, he doesn't call it money. He doesn't just, he, in, in a lot of ways, money's neutral. You can use it for good or you can use it for evil. But he doesn't leave it there. He calls it mammon. He says, there's a weight and there's a power. Because this thing whispers in your ear, hey, there's security here you can't find in God. There's beauty here you can't find in God. There's status here you can't find in God. There's significance. There's something other that you can find here that you can't find in God. It whispers lies to us. And so Jesus calls us to be wise in how we look at what God entrusts to us in our resources and ask realistically between you and the Lord, are you honoring him in it? Is this area in our lives priority? Is he first? One of the things I've... Um, personally really enjoyed about this series is just having to honestly ask this question. You know, one of the things we did as a church in the beginning of our church is we didn't pass a plate. We just didn't because we said it's such a stumbling block, right? There's been so many people who've been dishonest and abusive with money and resources that there's a lot of people who aren't Christians who come to our church all the time and they're super cynical about generosity. And so they might see a plate go by and be like, I knew it. They're coming for my money. Um, and so we just said, let's not do that. Okay. But in, in, and I think it was the right decision in not doing that. I think we did lose an opportunity to teach about what biblical obedience looks like. I think we lost an opportunity in some ways to model for our children biblical obedience. When they see that moment come around every week and they see the faithfulness of their parents. Um, I, I still think it's the right decision for mission. But uh, we miss the opportunity sometimes to, to teach the truth that God gives to us that he's first. Uh, it's why I have really enjoyed this series to just hear the conversations where people are going, you know, uh, it's amazing to look at my life and go, when I got my house, I just got a mortgage. Or like, I just made it happen. I moved things around. I cut things. I, I talked to things. We arranged things. And we just got it. Why? Because in that moment, that became first. And some of us, it's like a car. Like, I got the car. Just moved stuff around. Made it happen. Because it felt like priority. And I've heard some people say in the little conversation this week, and one person said in the conversation, um, I almost wish I had a time machine so I could go back and ask the question before sliding into the mortgage or sliding into the payment, what's going to be first and how will how does this priority shape this purchase? How does this priority shape this purchase? How if God is priority? And because, you know, we get kind of like ninja-like in our disobedience when, we're, when, we, when we follow Christ for a while. We learn how to sound like we're honoring the Lord when we're disobeying him. 
Because we'll be like, well, you know, my home is my ministry. So I tied to that. <laughs> You're like, well, that was like some black belt Christian disobedience with the Bible right there. <laughs> like, how'd you, how'd you, <laughs> um, you know, like, oh, my family's my ministry. So I tied to my family. Uh, if that's the case, it's, you know, your ministry has become your idolatry, right? There's, there's one priority that shapes everything else. And that's the question of Jesus first and best. My obedience to the Lord shapes how I minister to my family, how I minister to my home, how I minister over here. Um, it all comes on. And I've loved that. I've loved that because, you know, we, we don't often get to talk about this, but it's a huge issue. Do you, do you guys do see this is a war for your heart? Right? Like, oh, it's so clear, you know? And we don't get to talk about it much. Because, like, money is the one, you know, we don't talk about that. I, I had talk about the, I taught through Song of Solomon, and no one said, we don't talk about that. And it's like, bro, that was crazy. <laughs> but when it comes to this one, people are like, oh, no, no, we don't talk about that. Why? Because money's the one thing we do that with. And yet, Jesus talks about it more than anything else. Because he knows this, this is a lot of what's going on. And it's, it's amazing to me how quickly we try to dodge or duck around. And I've just enjoyed just being honest before the Lord. What's this mean for you? This is real discipleship. You know, like one, one of the things... Um, I've said to a few people, I said, like, here's, here's the truth, honestly. If, if every Christian just tithed, we, we wouldn't need to do this at all. But this is how we learn. Right? Like, if every Christian shared their faith, we would never have to talk about evangelism. If every Christian learned, knew how to forgive, we wouldn't have to talk about forgiveness. This is something that Christians are growing in. And that's why I don't want you to feel beat up. If you're here and you're like, man, I, this has been a hard area for me, okay? Well, step one is getting to honesty. And then step two is, okay, you might not be able to get here where you feel like this is where the Lord wants me, but I can take a step. And maybe over these next few years, it's going to be the very first time you have consistently been generous, even if it's 2%, with the hope of, hey, one day we'll bump up to three. One day we'll get to five. One day we'll get to nine. You'll see it all get easier. And it's the one thing God goes, come on, test me in this. But the beauty of teaching it and having the conversations and wrestling honestly is there's a, a war for your heart to go, this needs to be first, this needs to be first, this needs to be first, this needs to be first. And we get to say, no, 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 God, I want you to be first and best. You gave your first and best in your son. How do I respond first and best to you realistically with what you've given to me? Here's, here's the second point. But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he's going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill. We take this course so that no one should blame us about this generous gift that's being administered by us. For we aim at what is honorable, not only in the Lord sight, but also the sight of man. And with them, we are sending our brothers whom we've often tested and found earnest in many manners, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. As for Titus, this is my partner and fellow worker for your benefit. And as for our brother, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. He's like, all right, notice it, it's, it's almost meticulous to read it, right? He's taking pains to describe it. He's going, okay, just so you know, you're going to give this generous gift. Here's the leaders who are walking with it. Here's the vision. It's clear. Here's the things we're doing to be transparent and accountable because we know the truth, sadly. Sometimes this stuff gets abused, right? And one of the reasons some people never get to doing the work of God is because they've invested and gotten discouraged by unkind of 
godly leaders who've embezzled or broken churches that have lied, and it's made them cynical. But here's the thing. You, the, the truth is for the Christian, they have to ask this question here. Do I trust the leadership? Do I know the vision? It, is this a trustworthy ministry? My job is to be faithful and generous. Not foolish, not just go like, you know, dudes are showing up in planes. You're like, I don't know. But it's like, am I, my job is to be generous. Are they being faithful? Do I trust the leadership? Do I trust the vision? Right? Some, sometimes people are like, oh, I'm talking about money. I'm out of here until the money series is done. Then I'm back. Right? You can't, you realize you can't walk away. If, you're, if every time the issue of money comes up, you walk away. And praise God, this is not an issue here. Uh, you have to walk away from Jesus, not the series. Like the, this will follow you wherever you go. Jesus wants your heart on this issue. He wants you to trust him on this issue. He, he, he wants, you can't, if you try to walk away from this, you're going to have to walk away from the scriptures. You're going to have to walk away from faith. You're going to have to walk away from Jesus because Jesus talks about it a great deal. But churches should try to ask, am I honorable in both the sight of God, but also the sight of man? In this era, we above reproach. I shared with you guys just a few weeks ago, a couple things we try to do as a church. Pastors can't touch the money. Pastors can't write the checks. Uh, we were blessed early to hire a CFO who's been an amazing gift to us as a church. We get outside audited every year. Our outside auditor has told us uh, in the past we are the most organized financial church they've ever worked with. And that's a result of some of his excellent work and the desire for us to be honorable in this area, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also the sight of men. We want to be wise and transparent and honest because we know this area, sadly, there's a lot of cynicism, um, but abuse does not equal disuse. And so we try to honor the Lord in that area to be above reproach. Here, here, here's the third one. He says, uh, so give proof before the churches of your love and of your boasting about you to these men. Now it's super flows for me to write to you about the ministry for the saints, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the people of Macedonia, saying that Achaia has been ready since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. But I'm sending the brothers so that our boasting about you may prove empty, may not prove empty in this matter, so that you may be ready as I said you would be. Otherwise, if some Macedonians come with me and find that you're not ready, we would be humiliated to say nothing of you for being so confident. I love it. He's like, okay, you guys are being generous. Your generosity is encouraging this church over here. And, and this group of Christians over here is seeing it and they're being encouraged. One of the things about being someone who's a doer for the glory of God, your faithfulness doesn't just bless you and bless your family. Other Christians see it and they're encouraged, right? How, how many times, how, I hope you have a friend like this, I have a few friends, every time I get to spend time with them, I walk away and go, I want to be a better Christian. And sometimes I want to read the Bible more. Sometimes I want to share my faith more. Sometimes I want to trust God in this area more. But I hope you have a few friends who every time you get with them, you see their faithfulness and it motivates you to say, I want to be that. And then hopefully you are for others. And here's what Paul's saying to the church. As you're faithful in generosity, you know what's going to happen? The other churches are going to see your faithfulness. It's going to encourage them. He's going, look, Corinthians, God's positioned you in a place where you're doing well. You're strong. He's like, you're blessed. You have economic resources. And he says, now, now the hope isn't that you'd go into poverty. Then we'd have to do a whole nother campaign to take you out of poverty. He says, but the hope is that you'd be generous because God, why do you think God's entrusted you that much? Why has God put that in your life? I, I guarantee you it's not solely to live in self-indulgence. Part of it is to be an example of generosity that encourages lots of other people. He goes, and when you're faithful like that, it encourages other believers. It encourages other churches. You know, um, Years ago, when we started the church, a lot of people came up and they're like, you can't church plant in New, New Jersey. It's too, it's too expensive. It's too hard. And, and you know what? We said, well, we think 
God's faithful and people need the gospel. And if God wants to do it, he's going to do it. And praise God, other other Christians and other churches see it and say, you can plant a church in North Jersey. God's faithful. When, when we ran out of space and we needed to acquire more space, we met with realtors. The realtors all said this. They said, it won't happen. It's impossible. That space, that location, that parking, it doesn't exist in North Jersey. Doesn't exist. You guys are wasting your time. And God said, we'll see about that. You know, he, he makes, well, that's God's work. You know, he makes a way like, but he can, he's faithful. And the hope is when other churches see your faithfulness, it encourages them. I've gotten calls from a number of pastors since we started this series going, we're praying for you guys. We want to see it happen. We want to see what happens when a church goes and really trusts and really is faithful. Like, they're going, let's see what God can do. And they, I guarantee you, they're, you know, going to their staff team and looking at them, those, those morons can do it, you know, like anyone can. So just trust God, just trust him. And as you trust and walk in, with him, you'll, you'll be surprised how much it encourages other, other believers. You'll be how much, uh, encouraged how much of a blessing it is to the kingdom of God. And then, and then here's the last one. He says, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you've promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, not an exaction. He goes, I want you to feel like when you give to the Lord, when you give to his work, it's a willing gift, not an exaction. Because I want you to do it joyfully and freely. No one here at Emergence is twisting any arms. This is between you and the Lord and what he's entrusted to you. But he says one of the ways to make it feel like a willing gift and not an exaction, he goes, start working the plan today. Right? Remember in college or high school, the first day you'd get the syllabus and when you got it, you're like, okay, here's the final. Here's what I got to do. And if I just read about 15 minutes, five days a week, by the time the final rolls around, I'll be good. And, you know, we, we all had that moment, right? We sat at our desk and we did the thing. We're like, 15 minutes, five days a week, boom, I'm going to ace this thing. And then uh, six of us in here did that. And you got an A and we're grateful for you. Uh, many of us lost the syllabus that day. And around the day before the final, we called one of the six of you. And I put myself in this camp, by the way, not the six. And, uh, and said, what, what do we got to do for tomorrow? What do we got to know? And you said, well, you got to read these books, about 700. And we're like, 700 pages? There's no way I can read 700 pages. And we tried our best, you know. That felt like an exaction, not a gift. Here's what Paul's saying. Start doing the little things today. And here's the beauty of that. And this is what we so often forget about life. That's so important to learn. The good things in our lives, they compound. They compound powerfully. So do the bad things. And so we often don't realize our bad habits cost us more than we realize. Because they compound. The good things you do for the glory of God are more beneficial than you realize. When I um, first started working at a church in New Jersey, when I was in my early 20s, one of the guys I got to work with was Pastor Ron Rumba. And uh, Ron, incredible pastor, and he, before he went into ministry, he worked in a tree service. He owned his own tree service. And he decided, in, as he was doing his tree service, like, I want to memorize some scripture. And so what he did is he wrote down a couple verses on a three by five card. And what he would do is bring those verses he wanted to memorize. He put them in his pocket. He'd chop down the tree branch. And as the crew was lowering the branch and cleaning it up, he'd take his three by five out and, and start working on the verse. And he got it. He got the verse. It took some time. He got the verse. And then he's like, you know what? I, I want to learn some more. And so he started bringing up. And he's like, maybe I could get this whole chapter and he, hey, over time, just cutting it down, he's got the whole chapter. And then he's like, maybe I could do a couple chapters. And, and then he bring the cards up, he got chapters. And then it begins to compound. Whereas memory is getting sharper and quicker, he's learning it, it, it more rapidly. And he's like, maybe I could do a book. And he did a book. He's like, maybe I could do the epistles. 
and he did the epistles. And next thing you know, he's like, I think I could get the New Testament. And he did it. He's like, what about the first five books of the Old Testament? And he did them. What about the whole Old Testament? And he did it. And it wasn't just Bible memory that as he was abiding in God and ministering to people, he was becoming more and more fruitful where he had great wisdom from his time memorizing scripture. So he's helping people who are struggling. He's leading people to Christ. He's leading people's kids to Christ. I will have, anytime I mention Pastor Ron, I will have people come up to me all morning and say this, I'm a Christian because of Pastor Ron. My kids are in heaven because of Pastor Ron. Like Pastor Ron shared the gospel with me. Pastor Ron had me memorize James. And all of that started with a three by five card that compounded. The good things you can do for the glory of God just start with you saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And if it starts at 2%, praise God, let it compound. Imagine you get to a place where you just say, okay, we're going to do 2%, we're going to save 2%. And we're going to praise, pray that it gets easier and, and we get better at it. And one day, could you imagine being at a place where you were doing generosity 10% and saving 10% and that 10% you saved started compounding and investing. And now you're at a whole different place where you're going, we have this big thing over here. We got to figure out how do we honor the Lord with it? Wouldn't that be awesome if that happened in your life because you started asking questions, what are the good things that are compound? What right now are the small things that are killing you. Like for some of you guys, if you cut out Starbucks, it's like a hundred bucks a week. You know, a hundred bucks a week over these two years is ten thousand dollars. Can you imagine going? Can you imagine someone comes to you and is like ten thousand dollars? You'd be like, "What? That's an exaction." But a hundred bucks a week, you're like, "That's a gift." The good things in your life can compound. The bad things in your life are killing you. Ultimately, Jesus gives us the greatest gift. It's not an exaction. God gives us his first and best in his son. And our prayer is that that gift that we receive would so reorient our lives that he'd be the priority that shapes everything else. And then we'd be people who do realistically in light of where you are and who you are, what's it mean for you to do realistically in a way that takes faith in a way that honors the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to pray that for us and we'll worship the God who's worthy. God, we, um, we thank you that um, just for the practical nature of this, this section of scripture and how it, you know, it forces us not just to make resolutions, but to ask, am I, am I someone who just has desires or am I someone who actually does? Um, and, and, and to pray, Lord, not, not in a way that's all a bunch of shame. Maybe there are areas where we need to repent and there are ways we're just sinking ourselves with foolish purchases. Um, but God, I, I do pray that we would be encouraged that um, the good things we do for the glory of God can compound quite powerfully in ways we could never dream. And uh, we, th we think for many in, of our own lives, the time we surrendered our life to you and how that's compounded in so much good. And we pray in this area we would surrender again. We ask all that, God, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.